The new one D&D drop is out and it's packing some huge buffs to races. Honestly, these are my favorite changes one D&D has given us so far and this one's packing some huge changes to classic spells as well. Let's break it down. Okay, I know everyone's hyped about the new Dragonborn. We'll get there. But first, let's talk about the new Goliath. So first major change is these bad boys have 35 foot walking speed, not 30. Which makes sense. They got long legs. They're giant people. Then they got this new thing, Giant Ancestry. You are descended from giants. Choose one of the following benefits. A supernatural boon from your ancestry. You can use the chosen benefit a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus and you regain all expended uses when you finish a long rest. So this is totally new and it brings a ton of customization to the new Goliath. And all the boons are based on different giant archetypes. So Cloud's Jaunt gives you a bonus action teleport up to 30 feet, similar to what Eladrin Elves get. Fire's Burn gives you 1d10 additional fire damage when you hit a target with an attack roll. It doesn't have to be a melee attack, this works for spells too. Frost's Chill is similar, but it deals 1d6 cold damage and also reduces the target's speed by 10 feet. Okay, so this is big because it stacks with the Eldritch Blast Invocations, Repelling Blast, and Lance of Lethargy. Basically, you hit a creature with Eldritch Blast, you push them back 10 feet with Repelling Blast, then you reduce their speed by 10 feet with the new Frost's Chill, and then you reduce their speed by 10 feet again with the Lance of Lethargy. That leaves a creature with just 10 feet of movement, which means after they've used all their movements, all they can do is reach the position they were at before you attacked them. Then we get to a really powerful one, Hill's Tumble. This is probably the strongest. When you hit a large or smaller creature with an attack roll and deal damage, you can knock that target prone. So this is just better than the Frost Giant one, because the Frost Giant one reduces their speed by 10 feet, but knocking someone prone means they have to use half their total movement just to stand up. I can see this one being amazing on fighters, where you make your first attack like normal, you knock them prone, and then all your subsequent attacks have advantage. Or if you just want to be a badass, you can be a wizard, cast Scorching Ray, hit three different creatures, and watch them all just fall over. Next, there's Stone Endurance, which is what all Goliaths used to have. When you take damage, you can use your reaction to roll a d12, add your constitution modifier, and reduce the damage you take by that much. At level 5, with a 16 in constitution, this is kind of like having an extra 30-ish hit points per day, which is pretty big in terms of tanking. Finally, there's Storm's Thunder. When you take damage from a creature within 60 feet of you, you can use your reaction to deal 1d8 thunder damage to that creature. This is okay. Damage from 60 feet away as a reaction is nice, but this one and the fire one are probably the weakest too. Then you get another totally new ability, Large Form. Starting at 5th level, you gain the ability to supernaturally grow. As a bonus action, you change your size to large, provided you're in a big enough space. This lasts for 10 minutes or until you end it as a bonus action. During that time, you have advantage on strength checks and your speed increases by 10 feet. Once you use this trait, you can't use it again until you finish a long rest. So this is kind of like what fairies and Duragar get at 5th level, which is the spell in Large Reduce. But this is strictly better as a buff because it's non-concentration and you get this crazy 45 foot movement speed. Finally, there's an update to Powerful Build where it also gives you advantage on any saving throw you make to end the grappled condition on yourself. Then you also count as one size larger for pushing, dragging, and carrying things. So I love this new Goliath. It's instantly one of my favorite races in the game. This Hill's Tumble ability is just gonna make them an insane S tier choice for fighters and paladins because it gives you advantage on all your subsequent melee attack rolls. Just to compare them to the original Goliath, they did lose the Mountain Born ability, which gave you resistance to cold damage, and they also lost the Little Giant ability, which gave you proficiency in athletics. But that proficiency has kind of been replaced with the new powerful build because athletics was only really used for grappling anyway. Okay, Bard, you're up. I roll a performance check to sing a song. Okay, sing a song. Wait, what? Sing the song. You have to roleplay the check. Uh, okay, okay, um... Somebody won- Terrible, don't even roll, nat one. You suck and your character sucks, wizard, you're up. I want to make an investigation check. That's an intelligence check, uh, solve this equation. A equals minus three. How did you get that so fast? I'm trying to be toxic here. I've been pumping my real life intelligence with brilliant. Brilliant is the best way to learn science, maths, and computer science interactively. I'm learning the skills to build a robot army that will one day enslave us all. It has thousands of lessons with new content added monthly for you to explore. Just a little bit of learning every day can make a massive change. 
Get started for free at brilliant.org slash D&D Shorts, link below. And the first 200 subscribers to use my link get 20% off a Brilliant annual premium subscription. That's brilliant.org slash D&D Shorts, link in description. Okay, it's time. Let's talk Dragonborn. So this is a new Dragonborn based on the feedback the community gave on the Dragonborn they presented in the last 1D&D drop. There are two main changes. Firstly, the breath weapon. When you take the attack action on your turn, you can replace one of your attacks with an exhalation of magical energy in either a 15-foot cone or a 30-foot line that is 5 feet wide. Each creature in that area must make a dexterity saving throw against the DC equal to 8 plus your constitution modifier plus your proficiency bonus. So straight up, you get to choose whether your breath weapon goes in a long line or a short range cone, which is amazing. Also, this only replaces one attack if you take the attack action. So if you have extra attack, you can use your breath weapon, then instantly charge forward and swing your sword afterwards. If they fail the save, they take 1d10 damage, which increases to 2d10 at level 5, 3d10 at level 11, and 4d10 at level 17. If they pass the save, they take half damage. You can use this breath weapon a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus and you regain all expended uses when you finish a long rest. That's the same as before. But the other new thing, which is even better, is Draconic Flight. When you reach 5th level, you learn how to channel the magical energy of your Draconic Ancestry to give yourself temporary flight. As a bonus action, you sprout spectral wings on your back that last for 10 minutes or until you are incapacitated or you retract them as a bonus action. During that time, you have a fly speed equal to your speed. So this is flight for dragons, right? Finally, the dragon race can actually fly. And because it's from fifth level, I don't think DMs are gonna be complaining nearly so much like they do about other races that get a fly speed. You can use this feature once per long rest and your wings appear to be made of the energy used by your breath weapon. Damn, wizards! They just toss that sentence in there like it isn't the most badass thing I've ever heard in my life. So if you're a blue dragonborn, you have these crackling electrical wings. And if you're a gold dragonborn, you have these flaming golden ones. That is such cool flavor. Overall, this makes Dragonborns a great race. I think this is exactly what they needed, and it makes me feel really excited about 1D&D because it shows that they're listening to us. Okay, so the original Ardling had three celestial legacies, right? Exalted, Heavenly, and Idyllic. Basically, they got some divine spells related to the legacy that they chose and a resistance to radiant damage. All of that is now gone. <laughs> now they're focusing in on the animal aspect of the Ardling. Now you choose an animal ancestry, which impacts your abilities. Climber gives you a climb speed equal to your speed. And once per turn, when you deal damage with your unarmed strike to a target, you can increase the damage to that target by an amount equal to your proficiency bonus. That second ability is gonna be great on monks and unarmed fighters, giving you some extra damage, but not really be used by anyone else. Still, a climb speed is very cool. Then you've got the flyer ability. When you fall at least 10 feet, you can use your reaction to safely glide downwards, taking no damage from the fall. In addition, when you take the jump action, you can flap your wings to gain advantage on that action's ability check. So this one I think could probably afford to be a little bit better. I'd like to take a look at the Manta Glide ability from the Simic Hybrid, which is another sort of animal style race. And this one says when you fall and aren't incapacitated, you can subtract up to 100 feet from your fall when calculating fall damage, and you can move horizontally two feet for every one foot you fall. That one feels a lot more powerful and flavorful than this one where you just glide straight down, but after the whole fiasco with the Hadazi, I can see why they're they're very nervous about giving any type of glide speed to creatures. Then you've got this racer ability where when you take the dash action, your speed increases for that action. And the increase equals 10 times your proficiency bonus. So it's an extra 20 to 60 feet when you take the dash action. It's okay. I could see it maybe being used for some types of barbarians and monks. Finally, there's swimmer where you hold your breath for up to an hour at a time and you have a swim speed equal to your speed. In addition, you have resistance to cold damage. This is probably the strongest one. I'm a big fan of swim speeds. When it comes up, it is hugely impactful and you get a fairly common damage resistance on top, which is really nice. Then there's the divine magic ability, which gets you any divine cantrip. And there's one that's really powerful. We'll get to in a second. And finally, you have proficiency in perception. The only other thing that Ardling are losing, if we go back to the original Ardling document, is the angelic flight ability, which was basically a bonus action super jump where you could fly up to 30 
30 feet, but if you ended your turn in the air, you fell. It was okay. I like this new version way more. They're not crazy powerful or anything, but they're a really flavorful option for players. But speaking about options for players, let's jump into the spell changes, and these are big. So the first one they've changed is Aid. Your spell bolsters creatures, filling them with resolve. Choose up to six creatures within range. Each target gains five temporary hit points. So the original Aid was kind of similar to this. It gave three creatures five extra hit points. It actually extended your hit point total. That's much better than giving temporary hit points because it meant that you could stack temporary hit points on top of that as well. The fact that this can target six creatures is really nice. It means you're basically guaranteed to get the entire party and maybe a couple of creatures in as well. But the fact this is temporary hit points and not extra hit points means I gotta give this one a nerf. Then we get to banishment and damn how the mighty have fallen. You attempt to send one creature you can see within range to another plane of existence. They must succeed on a charisma saving throw or be transported to a harmless demiplane for the duration. They can willingly fail the save. While in the demiplane, the target is incapacitated. At the end of each of its turns, they can repeat the save, ending the spell on itself on a success. When the spell ends, the target appears in the nearest unoccupied space, and if it lasts for one minute and the target is an aberration, celestial, elemental, fey, or fiend, it doesn't return and it's transported to a random location on a plane associated with its creature type. Okay, so this has been nerfed to hell. Originally, when a creature failed their first save, they were just gone. That was it. There was no saves every turn to come back. Unless you lose concentration, that's one minute of them out of the fight. But now, unless you're fighting something with terrible charisma, like a clay golem or a redditor, you're gonna have to get really lucky to take them out of the fight for any length of time at all. It's still okay. Taking something out of a fight for even one round is really powerful, but this is a heavy fall for what was once the king of suck or save effects. So Guidance is now a reaction, which you take in response to you or an ally within 10 feet of you failing an ability check. They get to add a d4 to that roll and potentially succeed. This is obviously worse because it's reactive. You can't cast Guidance on yourself to boost your upcoming initiative roll, for example. But also, I don't like it because it feels kind of metagamey. Let's say you're searching a room for traps. You roll a 15 and the DM says you find nothing. Well, is that a failed check or is the room actually empty? and you just confirmed successfully that it was safe. The DMs will have to tell their players if their checks fail so the players can know if they can legally cast the Guidance spell. And if the DM tells you, yeah, this investigation check fails, then everyone knows there is something in that room somewhere. I see what they're trying to do here, but honestly, I don't think it's going to play out too well in this form. I think you should be able to use it on any check, not just checks that fail. Prayer of healing, boom, this bad boy is buffed. So here's the original, you target up to six creatures of your choice and they gain 2d8 plus your spellcasting ability modifier hit points. New version is creatures up to your spellcasting modifier, so that's a maximum of five, and they also regain 2d8 plus your spellcasting modifier. But they also gain the benefits of a short rest. Celestial warlocks are going nuts. Seriously, this is fantastic for warlocks and monks and anyone who gets anything back on a short rest. Instantly, it's gone from average to a top tier spell. But speaking about crazy buffs, we've got resistance. It's a reaction cantrip, which you take in response to you or an ally within 10 feet, failing a saving throw. You channel magical protection to the creature who failed. That creature rolls a d4 and adds the number rolled to the save, potentially turning it into a success. This is crazy. Forget about your allies. This is just a plus 2.5 average to every saving throw you make across the entire game. This is an amazing cantrip. In fact, it might honestly be the best cantrip in the game now. Seriously. Saving throws can be brutal. Anyone who can take this cantrip is probably going to want to take it. And then there's Spiritual Weapon. When I talked about this yesterday, I missed that it is a concentration effect. It's still an insane spell, but that stops it being completely broken, which it kind of was before. And the last thing I want to talk about is something weird that I, I don't think anyone's mentioned, even in the 1D&D &D videos that D&D &D themselves put out. That is the name they've given to this 1D&D playtest. They've called it Character Species. Even in the first 1D&D playtest document we got, it was called Character Races. They were still referring to these different player options as races. But now they've changed it to Species, and honestly, this is something that the community has been asking for for years. It just makes way more sense. Race is a way that humans categorize stuff, but it's a very surface level thing. We're all still humans on the inside. But a Halfling and a Dragonborn, they're not just two different races. They're, they're very clearly different species. It's the same level of difference between a lizard and a person. It's a small thing, but race is obviously kind of like a loaded word, and I can understand why D&D &D just want to 
get the hell away from it, don't want to deal with it, and species just feels better and more accurate. Remember to check out the DM Secret Weapon on Patreon for hundreds of pages of amazing D&D content. Adventures, maps, new player species, subclasses, riddles, and just a ton of awesome things to add to your games. You can also pick individual issues up on my website, dndshorts.com, link in description. If you're getting into D&D and you want some quick one-shots to run, that is the best place to grab them. Thanks for watching, check out other videos on the channel, and I'll see you next time.